Hi, my name is Robin Trudeau and I'm the founder of Empower Total Health. And the topic that I want to talk to you about today is dementia. And most importantly, what we might be able to do to prevent dementia. Now, dementia is the butt of many jokes. I suppose that's what humans do. When we're scared of something, we make jokes about it to try to feel better about it. So you see those stickers on the back of Winnebago saying adventure before dementia. And people, you know, even my age, will, will laughingly say, I'm having a senior moment when they forget someone's name or phone number or some fact that they absolutely know they know they just can't retrieve at that point. Now, there's really nothing funny about dementia. I've lost several members of my family and extended family to it. My mother-in-law endured a 10-year decline into dementia. Several of my aunties have, have died because of dementia. And there's, there's just totally nothing funny about watching someone that you care about gradually lose all their physical capacities, lose their ability to take care of themselves, eat, toilet, engage in, in conversation. They forget who you are, they forget who they are. There's a total disintegration of personality before they gradually, painfully, slowly die. It's just awful. Many people assume that dementia is a normal part of the aging process, that it's just something that happens as you get older. And this actually isn't true. Dementia is a disease, or more accurately, it's a group of diseases. There's a, around a hundred different types of diseases that cause dementia. The most common of them are Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, there's frontotemporal dementia and, uh, and also alcohol-related dementia. There's quite a number of other kinds, but they're probably the, the most common. And if, if you look at the, the rate of, of dementia in Australia, if you're aged 65 or over, there's actually a 10% chance that you're going to be suffering from dementia. Once you get to 85 and over, the numbers are even more worrying. So 31% of Australians in that age bracket are, are living with dementia. And when I say they're living with dementia, the reality is the entire community is living with their dementia. So their, their spouse, their children, their siblings, their friends, and of course the, the healthcare system and the aged care system are all having to live and cope with these people who are suffering from dementia. So the, the costs of dementia are just unbelievable. There's obviously an, an economic cost. There's a, a massive emotional and social cost as well. And these costs are only going to go up. We've got, uh, as of 2015, we had three, 342,000, I'm sorry, 800 Australians. So say 350,000 uh, Australians living with dementia. And because of aging of the population and, and just population growth as well, it's predicted that by 2020, we'll have 400,000 people living with dementia. And by 2050, roughly 900,000 Australians with dementia. Now that's a really massive market share if you wanna look at this in kind of glass half full terms. So unsurprisingly, the drug companies have got pretty busy trying to develop pharmaceutical treatments for, for dementia. And unfortunately, their efforts up to this point have been pretty wildly unsuccessful. So the drugs that are used in uh, dementia treatment are not curative in that they don't stop the underlying disease process. They don't prolong the lifespan of the person suffering from dementia, and they don't change the outcome of the disease. The demented person who's treated with, with Alzheimer's drugs or other dementia drugs is still going to die of dementia. The, the benefits of these drugs are not experienced by the vast majority of people, and when they are experienced, they're, they're pretty minor. They're what's called clinically insignificant. So much so that back in 2005, the British National Institute for Clinical Excellence, whose acronym is NICE, which is NICE, advised the National Health Service in the, in the UK, that's kind of like their version of Medicare, to just stop paying for these drugs for the vast majority of, of Alzheimer's patients because the drugs didn't work. Now, unsurprisingly, this caused a, a, a firestorm of criticism from the drug industry and between their lobbying and the activities of, of the, the patient front groups, a lot of disease activism groups that people think are charities, they're actually front groups that are funded largely or, or even solely by the drug companies and people donate to these what they think are charities in, in good faith and it turns out that they're just a, basically a PR division of the drug companies. So there was a lot of lobbying and, and the UK guidelines eventually got watered down and 
and, and softened in terms of their position. But the, the fact remains, we really don't have effective medical therapy for dementia. And in the absence of effective medical therapy, a lot of people have latched onto the idea of, of, of keeping their minds active by, for example, reading, doing crossword puzzles, learning a foreign language, hoping that that will stave off their, their, their dementia. And there's some evidence of benefit for this strategy, both in people who are cognitively healthy to start with, so just old, older people who are still cognitively intact, and also people who are suffering from what's called mild cognitive impairment, or MCI. So you might think of MCI as like a pre-dementia state, in the same way that we now have diagnoses like pre-dementia, uh, like pre-diabetes, I'm sorry, and pre-hypertension. So MCI is pre-dementia. It's, it's, it's kind of like a, an intermediate step between normal healthy cognitive function and, and dementia. And if you have MCI, then you are at much higher risk of developing dementia than if you don't. Aside from just keeping your brain active, there are more formal cognitive training programs that are being developed to, to try to prevent dementia. Some of them are, are delivered by health professionals. Increasingly, they're designed so that they can be delivered by computers so people can actually do their, their cognitive therapy, um, or their cognitive stimulating therapy at home. And again, the studies have shown some benefit for these strategies, but results have been mixed and, and, and not, not necessarily breathtaking in their scope. It turns out, though, that keeping your body active in very specific ways may be a better strategy for staving off cognitive decline and, and dementia than, than stimulating the brain matter. A team of Australian researchers based here in Sydney conducted a really interesting study, a, a very well-designed study, in fact, that compared the effectiveness of a, a formal cognitive training program. So this was computer delivered. There were multiple modules. Uh, it was structured, multi-domain. So people worked through this program uh, step by step. And they compared that to a high intensity progressive resistance training program. So this essentially was weight training. They sent people into the gym and under supervision, they worked them out on the weights machines. So working the major muscle groups of the body uh, at a fairly high intensity and using progressively greater weights as the participant strength increased. And what they wanted to do was, was to compare the effectiveness of the cognitive training program with the physical training program in, in terms of how effective it was at preventing people who already had mild cognitive impairment from progressing or declining, you might say, into dementia. So they had 100 adults recruited into this study and they randomized them. So they just randomly allocated them in, into one of four groups. So you had your cognitive training group, they did the computer program, and they had what, was, what, what the researchers called a sham exercise intervention. So this was like a placebo control. They basically got these people in a room and had them stretch a bit and sit on chairs and do a few calisthenics. Nothing very strenuous, nothing that would raise the heart rate, nothing that would make them any physically stronger. So that's your cognitive training group. Then you had your progressive resistance exercise exercise group. They were sent off to the gym and worked out and then they also had a sham cognitive intervention. So they got herded into a room, they were shown some nature documentaries, uh, National Geographic type stuff and then asked questions afterward. Then you had a combined group. So they did the cognitive training and the physical training and then you had a control group. So they got the sham exercise program, sitting in a chair and doing arm circles, and the sham cognitive intervention, sitting in a room and watching documentaries. And then they followed up these, these older people who, you remember, already had a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment. They followed them up for 18 months. And what they found was really nothing short of fascinating. Now, they, they had anticipated on the basis of previous studies that the people who were randomised to the exercise only group would have really dramatic uh, improvements in their executive function. And this is exactly what happened. Executive function describes the higher order cognitive skills that we use to control and coordinate all our other thinking abilities and our behaviour so that we can plan and execute goal-oriented behavior. And the goal might be anything from getting dressed in the morning to planning a space mission. Both of those, both of those and anything in between involves executive function. What was really interesting though, and this was quite contrary to the researchers' expectations, was that the exercise only group actually did better, substantially better, than the combined group, the people who were getting the cognitive training and the exercise intervention as in 60% better scores in terms of executive function at six month follow up and 74% better at the 18 month mark. 
Now, the researchers weren't really sure why this happened, but they speculated that the combined intervention was, was just pretty stressful. It was very intense, it was mentally and physically challenging, and they wondered whether the participants, because of this additional load in their lives, might have kind of dropped out of home and, and community engagement and, and, and done a few less activities that promote cognitive health, but they weren't really sure. Bottom line, though, was, was that intense physical exercise was incredibly effective at improving executive function. Resistance training also improved the proportion of people who achieved normal test scores, as in uh, the scores that you would get if you didn't have mild cognitive impairment, on tests of, of what's called global cognitive function, which is pretty much just overall thinking ability. Whereas cognitive, uh, cognitive training actually had no effect on, on this. It's very surprising. The take home message is that if you want to stave off both physical decline and mental decline as you get older, you really have to work your body and you have to work it hard. Those gentle exercise for seniors classes where you, you know, do a bit of stretching and maybe lift a half a kilo dumbbell, they just will not cut it. They don't work. They don't make people physically stronger and they certainly don't improve their, their cognitive well-being or their thinking ability as well. The problem is, of course, that older people and most particularly older women don't necessarily feel terribly comfortable going to a gym and going into the weights room and competing for, for space and machines with some 25-year-old steroid-infused, sweaty, stinky muscle jockey. So the best bet, if, if, if that describes you, is Find a small personal training studio, or even better, a studio that's run by an exercise physiologist who, who just has a lot more training in terms of, of helping you to exercise safely and correctly. Um, just short of that, a, a, an experienced personal trainer who's done some, some additional training, some additional studies in working with older people is a great idea. And you may even be eligible for a Medicare referral from your GP. So ask your GP if you qualify for that program. Then you can go see an exercise physiologist and get a program designed for you. Now remember, your, your resistance exercise program needs to be challenging. If you can lift a weight, you know, 15, 20 times and not even raising a sweat, that's just not hard enough to offer benefit. And aside from being uh, challenging, the program needs to be what's called progressive. And what this means is that once you reach the point where you can do eight or 10 repetitions of an exercise with a particular weight and it's getting easy, you make it harder by increasing the weight or changing to a more challenging version of the exercise. I should also mention here that, that cardiovascular disease, heart and blood vessel disease, is a major risk factor for developing Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, which are the two most common forms of dementia. It's extremely probable, it's almost certain, that the same dietary risk factors that, that put you at high risk of having a heart attack um, or other, um, or, or angina or other manifestations of cardiovascular disease also contribute to brain disease. And there's an old saying that says you can't out-exercise a bad diet. And this is true whether you're 25 and want to have a six pack or whether you're 85 and don't want to end up in a nursing home suffering from dementia. So be sure to couple your resistance exercise training program with a heart healthy eating plan, which I have a lot of information about on my website, empowertotalhealth.com.au. So if you have listened up to this point, you're thinking, this sounds like a good plan, but I have no idea where to get started. Or I've tried exercising before, but I just can't get into the habit or I go well for a couple of weeks and then I fall off the wagon. I've never been able to maintain an exercise habit. I'm actually covering this very topic, how to work exercise into your life, how to set up a, an exercise routine that benefits you and that you can live with forever. I'm, I'm covering this in detail in a webinar that I'm running for members of my Empower Ed program. That's education that empowers you. And the webinar is called Get Moving, How to Set Up and Maintain an Exercise Routine that Works for You. It's going to be at 8 p.m. That's Sydney time on the 28th of February uh, this year, 2017. And you can get all the details of the program at empowertotalhealth.com.au slash empowered. So that's just E-M-P-O-W-E-R-E-D. And if you are not yet a member of the program, your first month is free. So go ahead and join uh joining the program we'll be covering in detail how to how to put an exercise program together and how to stick to it. And of course there'll be plenty of, of opportunity for 
audience questions and participation. So I hope this has been valuable for you. And if it has, please like the video, share it with your friends. And I look forward to speaking with you again next week.